So welcome to another episode of Fertility Futures. This is an online feminist forum that seeks to understand what a feminist intersectional analysis of fertility looks like and what fertility can tell us about social, economic, and political changes. And this is part of um, a broader project called um, Changing Infertilities, and this is a Welcome Trust project uh, run uh, here at the University of Cambridge and Yale University. My name is Julieta Chaparro. I am a lecturer in sociology at the University of Cambridge. And broadly speaking, my work seeks to bring together reproductive justice and decolonial feminisms to think about reproductive abuse beyond the question of infertility. So today is really my great pleasure uh, to have Laura Briggs. She is a professor in women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts. She's a historian and I would say a little bit of an anthropologist as well, whose work has focused on reproductive politics and US imperialism. She's the author of multiple books and articles, including Reproducing Empire, Race, Sex and Science and US Imperialism in Puerto Rico, Somebody's Children, The Politics of Transracial and Transnational Adoption, How All Politics Became Reproductive Politics, and her latest book, Taking Children, A History of American Terror. So welcome, Laura. It's such a pleasure having you today. It's an honor to be uh, here. So I would like to start by asking you how you became a historian of reproductive politics. Oh, that's an interesting question. So I was um, I was living in the Dominican Republic, and mm -hmm. I was thinking to, with people about the consequences of structural adjustment policies, and I was um, I was fascinated by the work that people were doing on. Um, on how it affected the question of women and raising children and um, food security, um, schools. And so that's what got me started. I was also um, before that living in Boston, working with um, Puerto Rican independence activists who were interested in the question of sterilization abuse in um, Puerto Rico. And so that sort of defined a kind of set of parameters of things I was interested in. Um, what we would call social reproductive labor, the work of raising a next generation, caring for elders, um, caring for people with illnesses and disabilities on the one hand, and biological reproduction on the other. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that part. That's very interesting. And then that's when you decided to go for a PhD, I assume. Yes. Okay. When I was living in the US, it seemed to me like there were too many people with PhDs. It was um, the it was the late 80s. And I was feeling like all the activists were disappearing into academe and that that was a bad thing to do and that I should stay outside and do the work. Um, and then I went to, then living in Latin America, it was very sort of forcefully brought home to me that there's a real role for scholars in um, social movements. And I think that Latin America in a lot of ways has a much more developed sense of that than folks in the United States, but it was very moving to me. and. And frankly, I'd always wanted to become an academic. I just thought it was a bad thing to do. <laughs> so I got permission from okay. my friends and colleagues in the Dominican Republic. Oh, I think I think you're absolutely right. There is a longer tradition in Latin America for scholars to be engaged in social movements. So, well, I'm glad that life took you there and gave you permission to become a scholar. So I wanted to... Um, move to one of the broader questions or themes in your research is this question or the intersections between US imperialism and reproduction. So what do you think we can learn when we study US imperialism from the vantage point of reproduction? And in turn, what do the scholarship of in reproduction can gain from engaging with questions of imperialism? Oh, this is a, like a really distinctive feature of your work and, and that's something that has inspired me personally, and you know that. So yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. 
Well, I love that question. And yes, it's exactly what I've been trying to think about for so long. And I was very much inspired by the work of um, Puerto Rican activists, both in the archipelago and in the States, um, who had always linked those questions. Mm -hmm. and, I, um, and I felt like the conversation about imperialism in the United States was sort of drastically impoverished by focusing on US militarism, um, which is not to say that that's not an overwhelmingly important question, it is, but it's not the only question. Um, and so I was, I wanted to write about, I wanted to write a dissertation and then a book about um, exactly what reproduction had meant in terms of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Mm -hmm. And that there was sort of a long history behind the activists that I knew and their intuition that reproduction was the heart of things. Mm -hmm. And in Puerto Rico, it seemed to me that the, <clears throat> The questions were always foreclosed in a way about both militarism and straight up um, economic extraction. There was a long period during the Cold War, no longer true now for sure, in which um, the United States was actively subsidizing a lot of um, people's well-being in, in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and it really trying to produce Puerto Rico as a showcase for why Cuban style socialism was not in the best interests of Latin Americans. And so for a handful of years, money was being pumped into Puerto Rico. And so neither extraction nor a fight over militarization was exactly the heart of things in Puerto Rico. And, but questions of sexuality, prostitution policy or policy affecting sex workers, and questions of population, of so-called overpopulation, and um, fights over the birth control pill and whether birth control should be legal at all, questions of sterilization. And then um, once there were significant numbers of Puerto Ricans moving to the States, the question of sort of a culture of poverty politics in which sort of improperly raised children produced um, poverty over generations, single mothers and I don't know, bad children. Um, so that was, that was what was interesting to me about Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican activists across many generations. Not that there wasn't an independence movement in Puerto Rico, there absolutely was, and resistance to US occupation and of course the movement in um, Vieques against the sighting of a US, um, well, several US military bases there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I thought reproduction was a much more interesting question. And reproduction is just sort of everything, right? Um, yeah. There's no question that is not ultimately touched by reproduction. Yeah. And so if you wanna study anything, you can study it through the lens of reproduction. Yeah, and I think this is a theme that really becomes clearly articulated in your book, How Politics Became Reproductive Politics. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not escape, it's, you cannot escape that. Questions of overpopulation are questions about fertility, who is born, whose lives are valuable, uh, whose children, you know, deserve to have a decent life. So it, 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 it's really, it's really, um, you know, like a really key aspect. And, and I'm glad that you brought this up, like, because one of the points of this uh, project is really dragging to use Raina Rapp and Faye Ginsburg you know, phrase is dragging reproduction to the center of social analysis. And this is exactly what you do in your scholarship and in your work. Um, so talking a little bit about the, the, the title of this uh, forum, which is Fertility Futures, um, what is interesting is that your work or in your work, you 
revolve or you work more with the category of reproduction more than fertility. But you have theorized or you have proposed this concept of structural infertility. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more how this concept came to be and what are the social phenomena that this concept is describing and naming. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more on, on, on that. Sure, I'd love to. So structural infertility is a concept used by demographers um, that it seems to me has great potential for um, feminists and other scholars of reproduction to think with, um, which is simply the, the conditions of our lives that lead people to not have, um, not have children, biological children, not reproduce in a um, biological way, or um, to wait until quite late in, um, in one's fertile years to try to get pregnant. And so what does that have to do with us now? Well, the now I'm thinking so much about Roe v. Wade after what just happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the the leak of Alito's opinion um, overturning Roe v. Wade, but since um, since in the United States Roe v. Wade and since the widespread availability of birth control, in fact, before that, and in in other countries, it has less to do with that particular marker. But um, it's simply the ability to delay childbearing and that enables vast numbers of people to enter the workforce. Yeah. And that's been really, really good for, um, for neoliberal capitalism. The more um, people enter the workforce, frankly, the less each of them has to be paid. Mm -hmm. um, because if you can build households with multiple adults, well, then what constitutes a living wage goes down. Um, because multiple adults are contributing to household income. And so since the early 1970s, we've seen rising numbers of women, mothers, and other feminized people entering the labor force and um, delaying childbearing until they're relatively well established in a career or a job. Um, as such that they can, you know, afford to take time off. And what that means is that the average age at first birth has declined from around 20 to over 30, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, it's true everywhere that the age at first birth is rising. Those specific numbers have to do with the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and when the age at first birth declines to in the, in the 30s, that means that more and more people are not gonna get pregnant or are not gonna have the number of children that they want. And so the reason that we've seen an explosion in the use of reproductive technologies mm -hmm. is precisely because large numbers of people who have some money and to have some social capital to spend. And it actually doesn't have to be a lot, right? You don't have to have $50,000 that it might cost US dollars mm -hmm. to use um, reproductive technology because you can use credit. And that's mm -hmm. a whole other conversation about the shift in the economy. Um, to a credit-based economy. But nevertheless, if you have either money or the ability to borrow money, you can, sh you can try to augment your fertility through reproductive technology. But structural infertility just means that we're seeing a decline in the number of people who wish to have children, able to have children when they want to have them, mm -hmm. and they're being forced to delay childbearing 
until such time as they've finished long periods of education and, and or long periods in the um, formal job market. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, especially like what you're saying is also, it, it, what is implied in what you're saying is that in fact, what is happening is the explosion of assisted reproductive technologies can also widen the disparities, you know, in reproduction that you have been traced in your work. Um, how you describe that in your book when you say, well, African-American women are more likely to suffer from infertility and yet less likely to have access to this kind of um, assisted technologies for reproduction. So, you know, widening the various forms in which infertility and fertility are stratified. So that's an interesting uh, point there. Yes, that's well said. Yeah, so I, I wanted to go to how politics became reproductive politics, because I think this book really made a crucial contribution in the scholarship of reproduction in recent years. I mean, you've been cited all over the place, um, you know, and, and you're telling us that reproduction, at least in the US, has been a central element that has animated discussions like political debate in the US, at least in the last decades. So I wanted to, um, to ask you, how do you arrive to this formulation? Um, and what do you think this framework can offer to scholars working on reproduction? The way you frame the question is so interesting because I was very much paying attention to a US genealogy of the political right. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that happened when the book came out is people from all over started getting in touch and saying, yes, you're exactly right. This is exactly what happened in Sweden, in Germany, in South Africa. And um, so it was, it took me a minute to actually understand that this was a process that had been widely repeated. And um, of course that makes sense. It's not like the political right anywhere is isolated from the political right everywhere. Um, so what I was, what I had been paying attention to since forever was how the, um, how the political right has mobilized around questions of, um, of the politics of reproduction. They mm -hmm. are, um, everything is the fault of single mothers. Everything is the fault of women of color who have babies sort of in the wrong way. And so all I was doing was charting out a, a story I think many of us know implicitly, um, but that's, um, it's just that putting it together in a particular way and saying, if you're paying attention to what the right is doing, they far more than even feminists have been talking about reproduction. So um, the question of um, pushing women into the formal labor force that I was talking about before, mm -hmm. obviously happened within a context of a certain amount of conflict over what was it gonna mean? Um, was there going to be childcare? Like there was a minute when that seemed possible. Certainly it was true in the United States in the 1940s when the mobilization for the Second World War was pushed huge numbers of women into um, manufacturing jobs with daycare on site. And so back to the early 70s, there have been, there were pushes to have on-site daycare as part of what business was doing as it moved more and more um, mothers essentially into the labor force. But that's not what happened. Um, what happened on the contrary was a desire to shrink wages, shrink um, the tax base that business was contributing to in the context of you know what we call neoliberalism, the exacerbation of the um, of the way capitalism works to underpay people and not to build government programs that that you know supplement what people are not making in wages. Mm -hmm. um, so no daycare, 
not paid for by the state, not paid for by business. Um, very little in the US, especially in the context of very little health care, um, including for um, babies and pregnant mm -hmm. people. Um, so there was, it became clear that we were going to see the rawest kind of capitalism. We were going to see it, the privatization of responsibility for raising children, um, feeding them, getting, um, getting health care. It was sort of structural adjustment policies in reverse, but it was hidden, right? It was captured as you know, single mothers are doing a bad job. Working mothers are doing a bad job. They need to intensify the labor that they put into raising children. Um, this also turned up as a controversy over immigration. So when Clinton is taking office in um, 1992, he is immediately caught up in a controversy about immigration. He goes to appoint an attorney general who has had a child care worker and um, a chauffeur working for her. And she is, she's just, well, they, I mean, the Republicans didn't want a woman in that position to begin with. And childcare becomes a way of, of not approving her appointment. But specifically, what do they lean on? The fact that her nanny is an undocumented immigrant. Yeah. And so that enables them to set off a panic about immigration that they call illegal. Undocumented people become the target under Clinton um, and a Republican Congress of all sorts of restrictions. Mm -hmm. Welfare reform is obviously the controversy that exploded, that was extraordinarily successful for conservatives in persuading people that people of color's calls for increased wages and increased governmental support, expanded voting rights were illegitimate. How were they made illegitimate? One effort was the war on drugs. Another effort was welfare reform. These things come together as a panic about um, crack babies. The idea that um, apparently most, some African-American women are using crack during pregnancy and producing a generation of crack babies damaged at birth. That crack seems to actually have no effect on pregnancies or very little effect on pregnancies mm -hmm. was utterly unimportant to this entire debate. So basically all the book does is follow a set of major, what are called culture war controversies in the US and say, look, reproduction is just absolutely central to everything here. Um, to how we, how the U.S. tried to do away with all sorts of government programs from housing sports to um, preschool. And that was the heart and soul of the right supposedly economic campaign to shift the size of government. Government was made illegitimate by associating it with sort of bad reproduction of single mothers and people of color. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I, one question I have is um, kind of like the historicity of this because you place this discussion really in the 70s onwards. But do you think that all politics have been reproductive politics even before that? Yeah, I do. I, the, um, I actually, I got into this back and forth with my editor about the title of the book. And yeah. I wanted to call it Why All Politics Are Reproductive Politics. Yeah. And they said, no, no, you have to, it has to change. So <laughs> you have to tell a story about how all politics became reproductive politics. Okay. And I, I dug in my heels for as long as I could, but they were <laughs> insistent. 
And they tried oh, yeah. all, they suggested all sorts of terrible titles. So I finally settled on that one as not terrible. Um, That's actually pretty good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, this has been um, the central insight of, you know, socialist feminists, Marxist feminists, back to Rosa Luxemburg, right? Is it... The economy is separated into the formal economy and the privatized economy. That which is privatized is um, housework, child, work, child rearing. Um, I've been thinking about the wages for housework campaign mm -hmm. in um, Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and how, so there's always, you can always sort of exploit for political ends the slate of hand that's central to um, to liberalism, to liberalism in a political sense um, or in an economic sense, that this um, this vast realm of things that are clearly work are cast as not work, caring for elders, caring for children, caring for people with illness and people are, with disabilities. If you make that private, if you make that unpaid unwaged labor that is um, simply available for um, feminized people to do, then there's always a way to turn that into politics. And that's precisely how the neoliberal revolutions in the um, beginning in the 70s worked. That's how structural adjustment policies worked by saying, you know, that's not government work and governments can you know, reduce their overhead costs by privatizing that labor. And that's been true since Marx, uh, since capitalism. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah it, it's at the core of, you know, of the economy, that's true. Yeah. I wanted to touch a little bit on another characteristic element in your work, which is a transnational approach to the study of reflection. Um, and this really was part of your early work on in reproducing empire and later developed in relationship to abortion and, and what you call later the offshoring reproduction. So how do you see the transnational approach contributing to the study of reproductive politics? And I think, um, yeah, I think that's something that is unique about your work. And I would like to know how you made these connections between these different localities and also putting into question the idea of the nation state as an isolated self-produced entity uh, when, we, when we look at reproduction. Well, one of the peculiar things about the United States is that there's a there's a kind of tunnel vision that imagines that the only important things are the things that happen internally in the United States. And this happens at the exact same time that the US has an archipelago of military bases all over the world mm -hmm. and is engaged in a foreign policy that causes it to direct the internal affairs of countries all over the place. And so I've always felt that contradiction deeply. Mm -hmm. um, it, contradiction is a nice word for it. Lying is another word for it. Um, <laughs> that it's a kind of cover up of U.S. empire. Um, and so this has always sort of pushed me to ask, how, uh, how is this accomplished? How is the silencing of the U.S. role elsewhere? How is an awareness of what's going on in the rest of the world, um, whether it involves the United States or not, suppressed? And the in some ways, the worst of it is that virtually no one can afford to be ignorant of what's happening in the United States if you live somewhere else. <laughs> and I honestly, when I travel outside the US, I just find that embarrassing, right? That the US imposes itself culturally and militarily and every, in every other way on the consciousness of everyone else at the same time that people who live here can't think about, I don't know, anywhere. Um, sometimes Great Britain, but 
that's about it. Um, <laughs> that's the map of the world. Right? <laughs> we still have a relationship with our formal, former colonial power, but that, that's it. Um, yeah. And so, so intellectually what that means is that I'm sort of constantly seeking to understand what does that cause us not to see? Because clearly that's a, a, a kind of silence that is productive of a kind of quietism in US politics around US empire or even just, um, now I feel like I'm quoting bad US foreign policy, even being a good neighbor. And I don't mean that in the FDR sense that, you know, we should be running things in Latin America. But uh, so the only significant exception to that is actually, um, on the political right, especially evangelical Christians who are sort of, and Mormons are busily involved in everybody else's affairs. Um, but for the, um, for the mainstream of, um, of US folks, not so much. Anyway, so at the end of the Cold War, 1989, um, it seemed like there was a moment where there was an opening for a different way of thinking about things in the United States. Mm -hmm. So what the Cold War produced was a kind of bilateralism that also authorized a kind of lack of awareness of any place except the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I I was in grad school in um, beginning in 1992. So I thought, okay, what we may see is actually an opening up of what folks in the US are capable of being conscious of. And that lasted for maybe a minute, um, the kind of the minute of NAFTA. Um, there was a lot of discussion about what, what were good trade policies. And I feel like it's even more true now than it was during the Cold War that folks in the US managed to have a kind of blinkered view of the, of the world. And I thought that was particularly true in relationship to recent presidential elections. Even somebody like um, Bernie Sanders who seemed positioned to say, actually it's possible to reconceptualize the role of the US government such that it provides um, good schools, good healthcare, um, pays for higher ed and so forth. What it, he almost never said was that would require reconceptualizing the role of the United States overseas. Like you can't have a massive, hugely expensive military um, that's way committed to, you know, an archipelago of 800 U.S. bases and have a U.S. government that does something different. Um, but that conversation just never happened. So I continued to sort of use the opportunity to write books to keep saying, like, it really, really matters that the rest of the world exists. Yeah, and also, for example, thinking about the, the context of Roe v. Wade and the erosion of abortion rights in the U.S. and the rise of, for example, like self-managed abortions, this, uh, there is a long tradition of that in Latin America, for example, yes. in Peru, you know, just bringing that conversation to, to reproductive politics in the most obvious way. You know, there, there is a long tradition of that in Latin America, like Peruvian feminists in Chile as well, in Argentina, doing this kind of work on the ground with like hotlines to provide information. And then it was like suddenly discovered that this became a topic, you know, just in the yes. context of, of what happened in the U.S. Um, so I just, you know, I just wanted to chip no, in. No, I keep that. saying that in yeah. two senses. Both that um, we can look to Latin America for what it means to provide medical abortion to people in places where it's illegal. And we can look to Latin America as a model for what it takes to, um, as a social movement, demand reproductive rights. Why are Latin American nations and 
people winning on reproductive rights issues at the same time that folks in the United States are losing. And then if we look to the model of women's strikes and other mass mobilizations, like the ability to get a million people in the streets makes a huge difference. Um, that's what's different about Latin America. And that's why we have to see the leadership of Latin American feminists mm -hmm. as utterly central to what we're doing in the United States. And when I tell students, you know, obviously the US can't claim any kind of mantle of leadership in with respect to the intellectual work of feminism right now, um, they just look at me blankly, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> what, what is she saying? Was that English? Um, <laughs> because there's an, there's an imperial feminism that says, you know, obviously feminism is what happens in the US and possibly Western Europe. And the rest of the world is sort of benighted and backward and we can bring feminism to them. But the idea that we're gonna to look to um, the scholarship and the work of feminists elsewhere, just, you know, it goes over people's heads, but we'll see if that continues to be true. Surely the context of overturning Roe v. Wade is potentially, um, potentially overturning Roe v. Wade is possibly gonna to lead to different outcomes in the thinking of US feminists. I mean, that's a very scary horizon. So that's the last question that I have for you, but let me just ask something else. Um, because in your latest book, uh, Taking Children, you return to a theme that you had already touched on in Somebody's Children, which is the, the child separation, right? But this time you put it in a long durée perspective to tell us that the Trump's uh, zero tolerance policy is really not an anomaly, but rather a norm in American history. So what is interesting about this formulation um, is, is you know, how to think about what you're saying alongside this, the, the figure of the child and how it's been mobilized as a horizon of meaning for articulating, for example, what Lee Edelman calls reproductive futurity. So what I wanted to ask you is like how we can understand reproductive futurity in light of this history of American terror as you describe it in the title of your book. Um, because I think this is gonna take us to questions of race, of immigration, of class once again. So if you can develop some of these threads and how can we understand that? Yeah, I love that question. Um, my first reaction to Lee Edelman is what on earth is he talking about? I don't know anything about this, but of course I do. Um, I mean- In a different way. Right. I formulated in a different way. Jose Munoz made the point quite elegantly and others have too that um, Lee Edelman is talking about a really narrow, um, a narrow group of children that, yeah. whose future matters. Yeah. And they are white and they are middle class or wealthy. They live in gated communities. They need to be protected. And the, um, at the same time, we see children um, put in cages by the Trump administration. We have a long history of using the foster care system in the US to separate huge numbers of black and Latinx and sometimes, um, and also native kids and sometimes Asian American kids and Asian kids from, um, from their parents and the, um, and also enslavement, colonization, settler colonialism, boarding schools. So, I mean, these two things do function, very much function together to um, produce racial segregation in the United States. If we wanna understand something that I kind of grew up with, but is just outside my, horizon of memory is the huge fight in the United States over the desegregation of schools, mm -hmm. um, which many people argue is really what 
is at the back of Roe v. Wade, in other words, or the fight over abortion in the US, which is to say, many people think that the conservative right was finally um, pushed into a position of embarrassment, of inability to continue to articulate why it was insisting on, um, on harm to kids of color. And so chose instead to focus on innocent unborn babies. Um, right. So it was a way of changing the conversation, not a way I would notice from reproduction and the raising of children by any stretch, mm -hmm. just pushing it to a slightly earlier stage. Um, yeah, where that purity can be imagined and you know projected on that figuration that really doesn't correspond to anything. Right. Also, unborn babies make remarkably few demands on anybody, right? <laughs> they don't need an education. They don't need health care. All the things that would cost money, either for the wealthy in taxes or for business in taxes. Um, so unborn babies are a really easy um, group of people to feel strongly about. Okay. The, um, but so Lee Edelman reminds us that these unborn babies and the children that the, whose future matters are always white, always wealthy. And when I wrote Taking Children, I was just saying what was obvious to a lot of racial justice activists which is the people who were shocked by Trump's decision to put children in cages in order to deter people from, de from claiming refugee status in the United States, from demanding assistance from what's essentially a state of war in Latin America, in Central America, and to some extent in Mexico, the, um, that this was nothing new. This is an old problem in the United States, but it targets particularly children of color. Yeah, yeah, as forms of, you know, as devalued life. Really. Yes, yeah. and as a strategy for terrorizing communities into not making the kinds of political claims that they were trying to make whether it was the American Indian movement, whether it was um, native people uh, fighting for their land, whether it was um, African-American communities in the context of school desegregation or the civil rights movement, communities have been terrorized for political ends by the US state um, since, the, since the period of enslavement and settler colonialism. That is, to me, Laura, that's really such a powerful insight uh, because then it shows how reproduction becomes a site of punishment for certain communities. And, and for me in particular, I was thinking about this in my own research in the cases of forced realization. I mean, this happened right after the Shining Path was dismantled. Uh, yeah. 1993, the Shining Path is dismantled, although we know that, you know, the kind of like the central organization was not led by indigenous peoples, but large, like the, the basis of the Shining Path were mostly indigenous folks. Um, most of the people who were murdered by, by the armed forces were indigenous peoples. And then three years later, you have this massive sterilization program. And it really, it, I don't know, for some reason, it really clicked when I read this. And I was like, okay, this can be seen as a form of punishment really for these communities who dare to rebel against a state that has you know historically marginalized indigenous populations so uh, thanks so for that point you know i no i that had not never occurred to me yeah. that's so useful yeah thanks. very useful yeah so thanks for that piece it was very helpful <laughs> and lastly i cannot let you go without talking about roe v wade and the leakage of this document, like 
what do you think is going to happen, you know, with uh, reproductive politics in the U.S., abortion politics in the U.S.? Um, what is it? What is the future? And, you know, what scholars of reproduction can say about this? So, of course, there's no other conversation anywhere I go right now. Um, the, the leaked document is, on the one hand, not at all a surprise. This is what um, conservatives, the Federalist Society um, has been working toward for decades, is to put people on the Supreme Court who would work to overturn Roe v. Wade. On the other hand, there is something about about confronting the reality of it. And it's such a vicious document. It is so contemptuous, so snarling um, in its tone mm -hmm. and in its snarkiness that I do feel shocked and shaken up by it. And I have to keep reminding myself that I'm not gonna become accidentally pregnant. Um, because I think what it clarifies for some reason uh, that people were struggling with before is the extent to which um, what the right in the United States has been fighting for is a distinctly minoritarian and theocratic position, which is 19% of people in the U.S. want to overturn Roe v. Wade. And the Supreme Court is a decidedly anti-democratic institution. We have been confronting over and over again um, in the last decade, the extent to which the US state is becoming increasingly autocratic and authoritarian. But there is something about overthrowing um, women's bodily autonomy and criminalizing abortion and making it implicit in that document that they intend to potentially recriminalize sodomy. Um, it also raises, and so, and gay marriage and homosexuality in general. Like everything. Right, I mean, it, the slippery slope is really, really clear to people in the conversation in the US right now that the only significant question is whether they will recriminalize miscegenation, um, intermarriage between people yeah. of color and white folks. That that's like, that's the question now, not will they recriminalize homosexuality, not um, will they recriminalize birth control use. Those seem like those are just gone. Um, and, Obviously, this is not a decision. It's a leaked draft. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it possible that the reaction to it will shake up the Supreme Court? I don't know. That is a question about two or three people. And, you know, historians are not in the business of predicting what two or three people are going to do. You can sometimes see what a, what the future of a whole society is, but that's the horror of anti-democratic institutions is they rely on the thinking of one or two people. Good God. Um, is, so right now the big questions are how, what will it mean to for individual um, people who can get pregnant not to be able to determine whether they're gonna carry that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Forced pregnancy has all sorts of implications for educational institutions, for um, business, for work, for the shape of a, of a whole society. Um, and it's hard to imagine a reinstitution of forced pregnancy on people in their 20s. We were talking about structural infertility and how the whole economy has come to rely on the fact that just about everybody in their 20s can be compelled to work. Um, that's gonna not be so true. So what does that mean? Yeah. 
we're going to figure that out. Now, are individuals trying to develop workarounds? Absolutely. When we see states like Massachusetts, where I live, become destinations for abortion seekers from places like Mississippi, possibly, yes. At the same time, um, states are trying to criminalize the crossing of state lines for people who are pregnant. I mean, that is, un that is really unprecedented. You know, the only thing to compare where we are is the, to, is the Fugitive Slave Act, which, yeah. they, which basically extended slavery across um, the United States and even across um, to states that had outlawed it. So um, we know where that ended. Fugitive, the Fugitive Slave Act produced a civil war in the United States um, among people who wanted to insist on the continued existence of slavery and people who did not want to be forced to enforce slave laws mm -hmm. in free states. So I have no idea what the future holds now for us in the United States, but it's gonna be really hard to undo 50 years of bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom for at least some people who had the opportunity to control their fertility. And of course, so much goes with reproductive and bodily autonomy, right? I mean, that's just everything. It's like, do you get to really be a citizen? And of course, what the, what the right in the US is now gearing, for, gearing up for is a fight that would criminalize abortion all the way across the US as a federal law. Yeah. So the future is not at all clear. The stakes are the same as they were a week ago or a month ago, but they're clearer to people than they were before. Yeah. Well, Laura, thanks so much for this. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts and for your generous you know, conversation with me today. And well, keep, uh, keep watching the other episodes of uh, this forum and bye. Bye, Julieta. Thank All you. Right. Laura, thanks so much.